Hello fellow dream chasers and Disney fans across the world and welcome to the latest episode of Kingdom of Isolation where in times of trouble why not isolate yourself with the magic of Disney. We're still in the middle of a heat wave here folks but uh, nevertheless we can we are continuing our road to the renaissance with our first trip into the 80s with the Fox and the Hound released in 1981 and it is based on the book of the same name by Daniel P. Mannix. And of course, it wouldn't be the Kingdom of Isolation without me having a guest on board. He was here for the last episode covering the Rescuers, and I've got him in to cover, at the time, the biggest animated film, uh, was it the biggest animated film in history at the time, The Lion King, when we get to the Renaissance period, for movies and film, Milk, Mr. Michael Magori. Hello again. Great again to be back on. Yeah. Always, is, always love it here. Yeah, so it, so yeah, including the anniversary, including the anniversary episode, this makes this your sixth appearance in the Kingdom of Isolation. Dumbo, Bambi, Lady and the Tramp, Rescuers, Fox and the Hound, and the anniversary episodes. Yeah, six. Let's say my lucky number six. His sixth appearance yes. on the show. Yes. Did you mention Nightmare Before Christmas in that that list there? Make that seven. They are fantastic. Seven. <laughs> I'm on my way. <laughs> yeah, make that sound. I, compl- I completely forgot about that when I was uh, going through the uh, the episodes that he was uh, in when I re- recorded uh, the Rescuers episode yesterday. I mm-hmm. recorded that one uh, June first. I'm recording this June second. Um, but the, uh, so if, if you want to check out the episodes that uh, he's been in, including our Christmas special on the Nightmare Before Christmas, you can check that out alongside all the films I've covered so far in the Kingdom of Isolation playlist in the top right of your screens. But yeah, here we go. Uh, Fox and the Hound, a couple of things to get out of the way first. This is the last film to have the uh, uh, distributed by Buena Vista um, at the start of the um, at the start of the film before the uh, the classic uh, Disney castle that we uh, that we all know and love from uh, the Black Cauldron onwards. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, and- speaking of which, are you changing your background at all for this episode? Yes, I do. I do have that. Set. I do have that set. Don't worry about that. Uh, oh. And it's, and this is this is all the, this is also the last film that also had um, the uh, just the, the end Walt Disney Productions at the end of the film. This is the last film that had that as well before we went into closing credits mm-hmm. at the uh, at the end of the film again from Black Cauldron onwards. But Alice in Wonderland did technically have some closing credits at the end of that one, but it didn't have like full closing credits yeah. until mm-hmm. Black Cauldron came along four years later. But uh, I I will say this, uh, this is definitely up there as um, this is this is another case of this being one of the more mature uh, Disney films out there, Um, especially given it's gifts, especially given how uh, intense the source material is with uh, some some of the some of the stuff, some of the more intense moments from the source material had to be changed for this film. And Mm -hmm. and again, some of those I'll uh, I'll touch on. as we go through uh, this episode, so here we go. Uh, this is you see, this is effective. This is in a way the end of an era, the clo- the end of one chapter, and the beginning of another when the Black Cauldron comes along. But nevertheless, let's go through the Fox and the Hound and spoiler alert in place if you haven't seen the film yet. So now, Highly recommend it. Yeah. So now to get the background changed and i did i did get it downloaded i just wish i i just wish i actually got it saved um <laughs> before i actually hit record oh, and God, there now. we go oh yeah Very i nice. mean i mean i mean i mean i mean this background it's easily one of the best shots of the film mm-hmm. yeah, no, yeah. I, I highly agree and there's a lot of great shots in this film yeah, yeah, especially definitely. in the opening credits Yes, the opening credits, especially. I think it is, it is in a way a little unsettling in in, in a way, yes. mainly because like for a majority of the opening credits is it's just like there's no music at all. It's just it's just the ambience, ambi- the ambience of uh, the woodland setting. Yeah, it, it definitely sets the mature tone that the rest of the film uh, sets up. Yeah. And, and 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 it's it's when it's when the music starts to uh, to kick in when you see uh, the um, um, uh, the the, uh, the vixen uh, carrying uh, her baby. Uh, that, that's that's when the music just ramps up right out the right out the gate. And yeah. and 
I, I, I will say this compared to some of the other films that I've covered previously, as far as film score is concerned, this is what I'm after as far as the film score con is concerned. A film mm -hmm. score that is going to stand out throughout the film. And this film does that really well with its film score. Yes. Uh, and I guess it kind of needs to because this is one of the few Disney films that has little to no songs. So yeah, it's very reliant on the score to get the emotions across. Yeah. And, uh, and, it, and it's, it's also one of those rare cases where we actually see a parent figure being killed, albeit yes. somewhat off screen. And, we, mm -hmm. and we, have, we haven't actually seen that since Bambi, I believe. Well, Bambi, probably, yeah. yeah. And, and, and we, all, we all know how traumatizing that particular scene was. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, well, see, all you hear is two gunshots with Big Mama watching on um, uh, fr from a distance. Yeah, it's... Um, yeah. Not a ple not a pl not the most pleasant way of starting things off, but um, but you, but you, but Big Mama's really really calming voice, voiced by Pearl Bailey, mm -hmm. and it effectively becomes um, becomes the new parent figure uh, for the time being for um, for, for this baby fox. Uh, hasn't it hasn't got a name yet, but we will get round to that very Finish. very shortly. Um, but yeah, uh, as far as as far as some of the animators are concerned, I see there was um, there was a lot of animators, including one Don Bluth, who did films like Secret yeah. of Name and American Tale, Land Before Time, All Dogs Go to Heaven, and Anastasia, which I may which I may put in as a special episode because Disney do own the Fox Library after yeah. all, and Anastasia is finally on Disney Plus. Finally. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've never watched Anastasia, so really, given how highly you're you're reacting to it, uh, I'll yeah, guess it's one to check out. Yeah, I say, I say, um, I say, because because uh, we had because there was Hercules that came out the same year, and mm. um, and a lot of people often think often associate Anastasia with being with Disney. A, a Disney film, and on a technicality, it is a Disney film now. So yep. on a technicality, Anastasia is now a Disney princess. Yep. <laughs> Shows you how good an animator Don Bluth was, just yeah. Or, or is he's still alive? Um, yeah. Yeah. How people, how he can trick people into thinking that his works are up to Disney standards. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, the um, let's say, and uh, what one other surprising name that um, a lot of people don't really know about. Mm -hmm. We mentioned Night Before Christmas earlier. One Tim Burton, believe it or not. Yep. Uncredit yep. And un Tim Burton was uncredited for this film. Mm -hmm. But yep. uh, was... There, was, there, was a lot of conf there was a lot of conflict between uh, Bluth and Disney and, a lot, uh, and uh, a lot of the team that were working on this film at the time, they actually left with Don Bluth to form their own studio. And, that, and that's what caused this film to be uh, delayed from... Uh, Christmas 1980 to about July, June, July 1981. All right, I didn't know that. I guess that does explain why a lot of the dogs in this movie are very reminiscent of like the characters from Old Dogs Go to Heaven and some such. Yeah, but yeah, um, so yeah, that, so that being said, um, we uh, we we end up being introduced to uh, uh, effectively the comic relief of. The film at this point. Yep. Uh, you've mm -hmm. got uh, Dinky, who is a finch, and you've got Boomer, who is a woodpecker. Uh, Dinky, voiced by uh, Dick uh, Dick Bacalayan, if, mm -hmm. uh, if that's how it's pronounced, and uh, you've got Boomer, voiced by Paul Winchell, who was the voice of Tigger in the Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh. The Pooh. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so the. They decide to they decide to hatch a little plan to find somebody to look after uh, the baby fox, mm -hmm. and um, this results in Boomer effectively uh, knocking on the door, and and then we get and then we see Widow Tweed for the first time, voiced by uh, Jeanette Nolan, um, 
who I just found out is actually was married to uh, John McIntyre. And they both they were both in the previous episode when they were um, uh, two, two of the two of the mice in the uh, in Devil's Bayou. Mm-hmm. All right. I yeah. don't know that. Uh, I say John McIntyre does voice uh, a character later on uh, in the film, albeit for mm-hmm. like uh, about half a dozen lines, if that. Uh, mm-hmm. I say Jeanette Nolan, she voices uh, Widow Tweed, who takes on the responsibility of looking after uh, the baby fox, uh, after uh, Big Mama and uh, Dinky decide to um, play havoc with her laundry. Yes. Mm hmm. Yeah. Could have been worse. They could have uh, could have done much worse to the laundry. Definitely, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, um, but they, they, they end up drop they end up dropping of all things her underwear onto uh, the baby fox. But um, uh, when the tweet goes to pick her up, and then she sees the baby fox, and she's just like, "Yeah, I think I, I can't I can't leave you out here by yourself." So. She take she takes him in, looks after him, and he gets the name. He gets the name uh, Todd. Todd. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, it's so uh, we end we end up seeing uh, Todd causing a little bit of uh, mischief um, shortly yeah. afterwards. Uh, the biggest one being um, causing havoc with uh, some chickens. Uh, well, with, well, uh, a chicken with her um, with her chicks while Widow Tweed is milking Abigail, and Ab- Abigail Abigail's getting a little riled up, kicks the bucket over, and yeah, there goes the milk for the day. Um, <laughs> I say a, a, a bit of a bit of a stern talking to um, from uh, from Widow Tweed, and um, and and Todd trying to play all innocent, and I think I mean. It, it it does it does feel reminiscent of most like parent child relationships that mm-hmm. um, that yes you do have these sort of things happen but part of you just cannot stay mad at them for long. Yes, yeah, especially with Todd. He's he's, he's yeah. I mean, I mean, he's just he's just a youngster. Yeah. But uh, that that being that being said, um, Todd goes out to. Um, uh, to have a little bit of fun with himself, and uh, then we see the rest of the main characters from uh, for the film. You get uh, Amos Slade, voiced by Jack Alberson. This was uh, correct me. Um, uh, yeah, this was his last film role because uh, um, uh, he ended up passing away about four months uh, after the film was released, and it's also his only animated film role. He, as a, he, he plays. He plays Amos uh, Amos Slade. Uh, we've got, and then we get Chief, voiced by uh, Pat uh, Buttram, who's been in mm-hmm. previous uh, Disney, films Disney films as well. Uh, but yeah, the uh, the voices of uh, the young Todd and then um, a uh, young Copper. You've got Keith Mitchell as uh, young Todd, and you've got Corey Feldman, who does the voice of uh, the young Copper. And Kevin. yeah, yes, yes. For, the, for yes, for those for those that paid attention to a lot of the films from the eighties, Corey Feldman was in a couple of the Friday the Thirteenth films, and most prominently, Stand by Me in nineteen eighty six. Didn't know Corey Feldman was in this. Yeah, as, as soon as I saw the name, I was just like, "Wait a minute, I've seen <laughs> that name somewhere before." Check IMDb. Boom! Friday the Thirteenth and Stand by Me. Let's say those are like the two most prominent roles for him throughout his um, mm-hmm. throughout his career. He's, as he, I'm pretty sure he's done a lot of others. Um, he's done a lot of other um, big roles. Uh, I know oh, from Gremlins, isn't he in Gremlins? Yes, Gremlins as mm-hmm. well, and the Goonies. Hey, you guys! <laughs> he was on a lot of films back in the day. Yeah, I say, I say he was he was one of the most prolific. Uh, actors from the eighties, um, from the eighties period. I mean, I mean, yeah. I mean, ju- I mean, just that itself. Two Friday the Thirteenth films. What, so, what? One of the most famous horror movie franchises of all time. Stand by Me, Gremlins, and The Goonies. You got five big films from the. You've got like five big films from the eighties there. 
absolutely yeah, incredible. Add Fox and the Hound to his See, filmography. I was about to say we could technically add Fox and the Hound to that list to make it six. Yeah. 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 But uh, but yeah. Um was it? and then we um so yeah, um Copper, Amos, and Chief. Yep, we got them all sorted. Um Copper ends up picking up a uh, picking up a scent, and uh, he just wanders off to go and find what the scent is. And it turns out uh, turns out the scent is actually uh, uh, Todd. But uh, interestingly, uh, interestingly, uh, th- this is this is this is one of the uh, this is one of the uh, the key points of the uh, the dynamic between Todd and Copper. That I mean, yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, what one of the lines from the uh, one of the lines from the VHS uh, a trailer of the film? Two friends who didn't know they were supposed to be enemies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. So yeah, they start off. They start off as friends um, when they're when they're kids. But but then, but then of course throughout. But then of course towards towards the end of the film, uh, they uh, they've grown up. They've they spend a bit of time apart. And uh, and then their and then their friendship is put to the test uh, yeah. as as their natural instincts start taking over, but we'll mm-hmm. but we'll touch we'll touch on that later. Um, yeah, uh, Todd and Copper they have they have a, they have a little bit of fun. They start playing uh, they start playing a bit of hide and seek, and you've got Big Mama in the, you've got Big Mama watching on from the tree, and uh, and then we get to for me the best song of the film, Best of Friends. I mean it's. It's mm-hmm. one of the, it's as 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 far as um as far as what I love about the the song is concerned as it it's 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 just it's just really it it feels it feels it feels somewhat uh it feels somewhat innocent uh, mm-hmm. if you will um has has those sort of like uh, uh that that childlike happiness yeah uh, about it uh, even 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 towards the end of the film where you. Uh, End of the song, sorry, mm-hmm. where um, where where Amos has uh, where Amos gives um, uh, tell, tells Copper off for uh, uh, for, you know, for, for for running off, yeah. But mm-hmm. um, but I say, but uh, but despite that, I say, like I say, uh, there's a lot of reasons that this is m- my favorite song from the film. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's definitely the standout. This is. Probably the yeah. portion of the film that you remember the most because, mm-hmm. yeah. So passing this point, it does it does get a bit dark, but it, it's yeah. just it's lovely seeing them to mm-hmm. just being just acting like kids. Yeah, definitely. Nice. Um, but yeah, the um, let's say they they end up they end up spending a bit more time together the next day. They end up go they end up actually going swimming uh, mm-hmm. together, and then the day after that. Copper's uh, uh, Copper's tied off, tied up because uh, yeah, a- Amos isn't happy about the fact that Copper ran off again. Yeah, and um, <laughs> you know and, and just Copper's dialogue at that point, it just it just sums up the whole situation uh, in a nutshell. Yeah, yeah, he's <laughs> mad. I need to get back pronto. And then <laughs> and then and then Todd doesn't really think much of it because he thinks, yeah, I'll uh, I'll uh, I'll see you again tomorrow. And uh, mm-hmm. and and then we. And, and then we cut to the shot of uh, Copper being uh, tied up. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I was just like, yeah, that um, that escalated quickly. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then do we is that the point where we get into the, the very tense moment of the film? Where... Uh, one of the ten, one of the tense moments. Yes, um, the first of many. Yes, because uh, you because we end up with this somewhat uh, comedic. Chase sequence that mm-hmm. uh, that's initiated by a chief actually being able to sniff out Todd, right. uh, and, and, and it's um, he, he thinks it's a badger initially, and then he's just like a fox, boom, whacks his head <laughs> off the top of the barrel, yeah, and, and then all and then all oh, yeah. hell breaks loose. Everything, yes. everything from the barrel being dragged behind uh, chief to crashing the gate open. Uh, the chickens being caught in the Going barrel as well again. at one point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then and then it's sort of like a a brief, uh, sort of like um, uh, a brief rest, and uh, as a massive emphasis on brief, brief, yes. uh, where uh, where the barrel 
uh, that's t- that's tied to Chief. It's um, submerged in water. Yeah, submerged well. in water. Chief almost gets him, but uh, but then the laws of physics, yeet, <laughs> and yeet. into the barrel. <laughs> Uh, and the, and, then, and then we see uh, Widow Tweed with uh, with these uh, containers of milk. Mm-hmm. Uh, she, she's driving off, and uh, and Toz is like, right, let's let, let's try and get on, let's uh, let's get onto this uh, pronto. And uh, Amos decides to chase them down with his um, with his uh, trigger happy lunacy, as uh, Widow Tweed uh, puts it shortly. Uh, yes. Yeah, just, <laughs> what's that mean? Goodness me! What were you aiming the thing? Yes, <laughs> and uh, and he even manages to shoot the milk containers. And I'm just like, yeah, that that that's two days uh, waste of milk. Yeah, that, that that's twice in the last three days that yeah. the milk's been ruined. Yeah, once, <laughs> once because of uh, Todd's mischief, and the other because of Amos's lunacy. <laughs> I would just give up if I was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, but uh, but not too long afterwards, uh, Widow Tweet does become a bit of a, a hypocrite in a sense, because she because uh, she ends up uh, having end, ends up adopting the trigger happy lunacy uh, briefly, of course. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, she takes she takes Amos's gun. Uh, shoots it! And shoots it! And his car's radiator. Yeah. <laughs> and then, Mental. And, and then, and then he actually, she actually has it aimed at his chest. Watch, Watch it! it. That, thing's, that loaded. thing's loaded. Points it away. Boom! Now it ain't loaded. What on earth? Now it ain't loaded. Where do a tweed is a, a, a bad, a, a, a tough mm. nut. She's a tough nut. She, she, she definitely is. There's definitely no denying that. But uh, don't want to mess with her. She's a kind, sweet old woman. But 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 if you pu- if you push the wrong buttons, pre- just be prepared for her wrath. <laughs> if you mess with her milk, yes. <laughs> Especially <laughs> the milk. <laughs> she just wants to get it out there. She just the wants public. to get the milk delivered for crying out loud. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the um um. Uh, but uh, but of course uh, the the running the running gag throughout this film, uh, tying back into uh, Dinky and Boomer, they're trying to catch Squeaks, who's a caterpillar, but they keep calling him a worm throughout the film. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm just like I... I'm just like yeah, this is uh, this is definitely um, yeah yeah this is definitely going to be the film's running gag, and uh, yeah. the. Uh, and the obligatory fun notes that I put in here um, is that uh, there's one particular point where they're like uh, like on the on the edge of a branch on the tree, and mm-hmm. you've got you've got this little hole in the branch that uh, squeaks is in. Mm-hmm. Boomer, Boomer goes, <laughs> and then and then the part the piece of branch that he's on falls to the ground, falls to. and then just. And then just classic Looney Tunes, wee! Wiley Coyote logic, yes. <laughs> yep. And at that point, I was just like, yep, cue the Warner Brothers lawsuit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I must say, must say, that ends up becoming a running gag throughout the film. Now, there's a whole myriad of things that they do to try and dare, uh, they try and ca- to try and catch him. They, um, I say, I say the whole the whole Wiley Coyote thing I mentioned, uh, g- going up the, going up the uh, the drain pipe, and then they're on blooming elect they're on the blooming electrical wires, wires. whatever mm-hmm. it is, yeah, and oh boy, I mean, it's, it's fantastic to watch. It's, it's yeah. great. It's great classic cartoon slapstick. It definitely yeah, breaks up the, yeah. the dark moments of this film. Yeah, which we'll get into. Yes. Um, so yeah. Um, so I, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say this is a dark moment per se, but it's definitely a, a more mature uh, moment. Mm-hmm. You've got um, you've got the um, uh, it, it starts to become uh, winter, okay. and you've got uh, Amos, Chief, and Copper. They they're going on a on a hunting trip, and they're not going to be back until spring. And Todd just misses him didn't get a chance to say uh, uh goodbye to him 
But then, but then, then, but then, Big Mama gives a, gives him a bit of a, a bit of a reality check, if you will. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That uh, that cop is going to come back as effectively. A different person. Yes. Which, which is to be expected when it comes to um, friendships and relationships that that start off when when you're because I mean, I mean a lot a lot of people that I know from like my school days a lot of them I don't speak a lot of them I don't speak to anymore mm -hmm. for various reasons uh, and, yeah. also, uh, and, and also and also um, and uh, and uh, especially especially with those from uh, secondary school it's a case uh, the um, uh, s some of them. They weren't. They weren't really nice towards me in their secondary school, and uh, I've only. I only encountered them like one or twice since then, mm -hmm. and it's a case of leopards never changing their spots. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's definitely a story that I think everyone can relate to. We've we've all had those those good friends back in the day where yeah, that they just sort they, of drift away. Yeah, we, as they say, uh, it's um, and, and 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 that's and that's one of the reasons why I feel this is definitely one of the. Um, one of the more mature films from that sort of uh, perspective, as far as mm -hmm. as far as friendships and relationships are concerned. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, it's 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 one that I think a lot of kids should definitely watch. Yeah, it's a, it's a much a must watch for children. I didn't watch this one as a child, sadly. Um, mm -hmm. I think I would have loved it as a child, but uh, yeah, I hadn't watched it until I got Disney Plus. Yeah, this yeah. was one of the first ones that I switched on because I'd heard so many good things about it, mm -hmm. and yep, yeah, didn't disappoint. Yeah. Um, so um, so and and then and then for the next few and then for the next few minutes we uh, we focus on this hunting trip, and mm -hmm. and, and we actually and we actually see, um, we actually see, uh, <laughs> um, we actually see copper starting to, uh, starting to grow up. Because, mm -hmm. uh, um, I mean, especially with that, if, especially for that sort of, um, especially for that uh, for that sort of breed of dog, mm -hmm. uh, especially they, uh, they they do go from like being like um, uh, playful, uh, pu puppy size to be like full blown yes, uh, adult with it within it within this within the, within the space of about a year or so. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, so they. Uh, Amos and Chief, they're they're teaching Copper how to hunt uh, effectively, and then, and then at the end of this hunting trip, we actually see him, we actually see Adult Copper in all his glory. He takes a different route from um, uh, from Chief to to hunt down um, animals to take uh, to take the uh, the skins for, uh, which we actually see in uh, which I, which we actually see in. Um, in uh, in Amos's shed after he's gone on this um, uh, yeah. hunting trip, and and I'm just like, yeah, that uh, yeah, that got dark very quickly, yeah. Yeah, that's that's when Todd comes to the yeah. realization that yeah, yeah, yeah. So like I say, that let's say that that was just like that was like the final nail as far as yeah. the reality check was concerned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th it's a case that yeah, this could happen to you, Todd, if you're not careful. Yeah. I'm surprised with how graphic it was. It's like it reminded me a lot of that scene in Ratatouille, where Remy's given the reality check. Oh um, yeah. Um, but that scene is sort of shrouded in sort of darkness and yeah. rain and thunder and lightning, so you can kind of misconstrue it. But yeah. in this film, it's in broad daylight. You yeah. see the the dead bodies <laughs> in the shed, and it's like, all right. Yeah, okay. and 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 of and of course and of course the uh, the small piece of their uh, music score at, at this point, yeah, it, it just it just adds to it's just, it just adds mm -hmm. to the potential danger yes. that Todd is going to find himself in when when he gets older. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sadly. But uh, but back to the hunting trip. Uh, Copper manages to find uh, some animals, and then and then Amos manages to shoot one or two of them down. And uh, and it's Copper that gets the credit for it, and Chief is just looking on, just like, what? How has he got so good? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a bit, a hint of jealousy, but I've got a feeling. Uh, yes, he's, he's... yes, definitely. Um, but uh, but interestingly, um, when I was when I was watching the uh, the animation look back, that um, Animate. 
uh, so, uh, Animat, yes. But, uh, mm. so he, he, did, he did an updated version of the uh, animation look back for, uh, for Disney, going from Snow White all the way up to Frozen 2. Uh, as he said, it was, a, uh, as it was an, an interesting analogy he took was, uh, was, Ch- was Chief being the, uh, the, the old animators, uh, the old crew that were there from like uh, Walt's day, Walt Disney's days, uh, and then Copper being the newer animators taking over uh, a sort of like a, a, a transition phase, if you will. That makes a lot of sense. That's, that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. That um, but say they they come back they come back from the they come back from the hunting trip and we see and we see uh, Todd all we see Todd all grown up and he's voiced by uh, Mickey Rooney. Now mm-hmm. I have heard I, say, I have heard the name Mickey Rooney before, but I don't recall what he has. Uh, he's in uh, he's in Night the Museum, the first one. He plays ah. uh, one of the the night guards. Ah, um, right there we go. He's got a very brief cameo in the, the recent Muppets movie. I know a lot of his more recent stuff mm-hmm. uh, prior to his passing mm-hmm. very recently. But, yeah. Um, yeah, great, great little actor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, he, don't, he does have a lot of stage roles to his name as well, mainly in, as I, uh, as I, there's a couple of, there's a couple in particular from uh, the world of Shakespeare. He actually had two runs in uh, A Midsummer Night's Dream and he was even in a stage production of uh, the Wizard of Oz between 97 and uh, 99. He did Midsummer Night's Dream 1935, and then he did it again in 1973. He has over 300 film roles over yes. his 80 plus year career. And uh, so I'm going to see if there's going to see if there's any that. Um, let me see if there's. It wasn't the Care Bears movie. Well, that's um, yeah, that one was. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the Care Bears movie that actually beat the Black Cauldron as far as box office earnings were concerned. Yeah, <laughs> kind of yeah. understand them, I guess. What, what, yeah, when you've got a when you've got the Care Bears movie beating the Black Cauldron, a Disney film, mm-hmm. you know you've got a little bit of problems in in uh, on Disney's end. Uh, he yeah. was in the as uh, but say Mickey Rooney. He was in the original Breakfast at Tiffany's in nineteen sixty one. Oh, right. Yes, he was. Yes. Sorry, I forgot all about that one. Yeah. That, that role was very problematic, apparently. Mm, yeah. Uh, he has done a, he has done a Disney role previously. He was uh, Lampy in Pete's Dragon in 1977. All right. So he, so he does have a Disney role uh, to his name. He was also mm-hmm. in the... Uh, he was... He was also in the Babe sequel, Babe Pig in the City, as yes, uh, Fugly Flume. Yes, he was the 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 clown. Ah, that ends up dying in that film. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, that one. Yeah, um, <laughs> and um, I say, uh, but of course he's, but of course he does have another Disney role to his name, a director video sequel, Lady in the Tramp Two: Scamp's Adventure, to be specific, where he voiced Sparky. Um, it's been a while since I've seen uh, Lady in the Tramp too, so I'm, um, so I'm, 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 I'm trying to remember who Sparky is. Oh, he's, oh, he's, uh, he's one of the, he's one of the dogs that's part of um, the gang, Buster's, yeah. Buster's Junkyard Society. Yeah. Yes, he's, um, he's the little tiny one. I think he's the sort of yes, chihuahua yes, one. yes, yes. Yeah, I, um, I, I know who we're on. I know who we're on about now. Yeah. yeah. Um, but. Um, but the biggest surprise now that I'm now that I'm uh, more familiar with his work uh, in yeah. regards to the voice of adult copper in particular. I was like, I, I didn't know, I didn't know his name at the time, but mm. now that I've, now that I've become more familiar with some of his other works previously, I'm just like, yeah, that's a big name. That is a big yes. name. But, yes. um, but, but we don't actually, we don't actually hear cop. We don't actually hear uh, uh, adult copper's voice uh, until a couple of minutes later uh, mm-hmm. and, it, and it's at night and you've got Todd um, you've got Todd coming coming to uh, Amos's house and he acts and uh, they act I think they've spoken to speaking to each other for the first time in what feels like a, a year something along those lines mm, yeah um, but uh, was it not the first time in a few months I should say um, but uh, yeah the voice of adult copper 
is one Kurt Mother Trucking Russell. Yes, Snake yes. Pliskin from uh, Escape from uh, New York. Big Trouble in Little China, Escape from L.A. He was in The Thing in 1982 and Ego from Guardians of the that Galaxy is... 2. Yes. Kurt <laughs> Mother Trucking Russell in a Disney <laughs> film. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. I mean... I mean, I mean, those big roles that I've already said, that pretty much speaks for itself as far as uh, his uh, resume is concerned. Mm-hmm. He, he, he is a long-time John Carpenter uh, collaborator. collaborator. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But uh, interestingly, he's, he's um, of all the roles that he's done, he's never once been nominated for an, for an Oscar for Best Actor or even Best Supporting Actor, for that matter. I guess the kind of films that he's in don't really cater to the Oscars, really. That's, um, that is that is they true, are yeah. sort of big action blockbusters. Yeah, um, the fun films. Yeah, uh, that the Oscars don't want to pay any recognition to. <laughs> yeah, because because the Oscars they they want to like more focus on like uh, the the dramatic the more like the dramatic films mm-hmm. and the um, social issues of the time. Yeah, yeah. Let's say, let's say, which, which is one of the reasons why, which is one of the reasons why a lot of people are not really too big, uh, not too keen on the, the Oscars, especially in recent years, because it's a case yeah. of having people in the academy that don't really know what they're doing, especially mm-hmm. when it comes to the best animated film Oscar. They're just like, uh, not seen this, <laughs> not seen this, not seen this. Disney, give it to them. Give it to Done. Disney, aye. Disney or Pixar. But but of course, there is the odd occasion where they do get, they do give it to somebody that isn't. Uh, Disney or Pixar? Looking at you, the Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, <laughs> which is which is now my favorite, which is now my favorite Spider-Man film of all time. I am very much looking forward to the sequel coming out next year. And I actually, I actually, yeah, wa- yeah, it's got a sequel on the way. And I've actually, yes. I actually watched Spider-Verse earlier today, and it's like, it's just so quotable. I mean, just uh, it's so quotable. It's let's see, just absolutely amazing uh, throughout. I mean, I mean, just just the animation style for it. Uh, as well Mm -hmm. um and of course that leap of faith scene yes yeah because 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 the shot where it looks like he's falling to the ground he's not falling through the frame he's actually rising becoming Mm spider-man yes because that's what the animators were going for he's not falling through the flame he's rising through the flame through the frame and what's up danger in the background as well. Doesn't matter how many times I watch that leap of faith, it still gets me excited every time I watch it. Oh, yes. And then my favorite side character, it can get weirder. <laughs> I just wash my hands. That's why they're wet. No other reason. Good old <laughs> Spider Ham. I love Spider Ham. Peter a- Porker. <laughs> you got a problem with cartoons? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I absolutely love Spider Ham. I mean, I mean, yes. if, if we got a solo Spider Ham film, I would, oh, I'd, I'd be, be very there. happy with that because just from that Spider Verse film alone, they've got, they've got a lot of opportunities to expand that. Mm-hmm. Now. Yeah, I know. I think they definitely should have yeah. a maybe even a series where it's a, a, each a, episode is dedicated to, to a, a different, different Spider Man. Yeah. That I can get on board with. Sony, where you at? <laughs> Let's go to Sony headquarters and talk to them. <laughs> so, yeah. So, that, so, yeah, that's two visits we need to do. We need to go to Disney to pitch uh, a TV series for The Rescuers and uh, Great Mouse Detective and yep. to Sony to uh, pitch the TV series for Spider-Verse. Yes. Yes. We'll head down in a minute. Ah, <laughs> after this review is over, we'll, we'll make our way down to the States. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but yeah, yeah. Um, I say, Chief ends up waking up uh, w- while hearing the, the conversation between um, Todd and Copper. And uh, yeah, th- this is probably, this is next to the climax of the darkest scene of the film because of, mm-hmm. of how the scene yes. ends mainly. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, you got Chief just barking, uh, barking, gets Amos's attention um, and and the, and the light comes on, and and Todd's just like, "Bye," <laughs> off he goes, and then, and then um, the dogs are unleashed, and uh, yeah, um, let's, see, let's see, this is this is this is when we get into full mature territory for um yeah. uh, for this film, 
because because you've got because you've got um, Copper and Chief chasing Todd, and then it all climax it all climaxes with um, Copper Jeez. finding where Todd is, mm-hmm. but decides to let him go because of the friendship yeah. that they are just because of the friendship that they um, they somewhat still have despite their their natural animal instincts, mm-hmm. um, and then. We we get we cut to um, then we get to uh, Todd uh, being cut off by Chief on a on train on train tracks on a bridge. Yeah. Now in an own coming train. Yeah, we all know how we all know how it all we all know how it goes. If you're on if you're on train tracks and it's on a bridge, you've got water underneath. There's always a train that comes along at some point. Yes, and uh, sure enough, uh, sure enough, a train comes along. Uh, Todd does manage to duck, but it's just the it's just the look of fear, mm-hmm. especially on Chief's and face Chief. at that point. You're just like, yeah, there's no there's no time to react to this. So boom, head on, and he sustains a broken leg. In the source, in the book, though, Chief oh, actually so gets died. yeah. Chief actually gets killed. So yeah. I think I think this is one of those moments where it is definitely justified that they didn't. Yeah. I thought it was going to follow through with it because I had heard for many years that this film was quite dark and rather depressing. So I thought it was maybe going to go that extra mile, but thankfully he yeah, only that's... sustained a broken leg. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Um... And, uh, and and Copper, he goes is he goes to he goes to check on Chief, make sure he's okay. But uh, mm-hmm. and, and then he sees Todd on on the railway bridge. He's, he's just like, I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna get you for this if it's the last thing I do. Yeah. And and, and sure that, of anger. Yeah. It feels it feels like he's maybe yeah, partly he, responsible. That that he that he he feels he shouldn't have let Todd go. Mm-hmm. And 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 it's at that. And so that's this is the point in the film where um, the friendship gloves are off. Yeah, it almost it almost effectively hits breaking point as mm-hmm. far as the friendship between Todd and Copper is concerned. Yeah, and then and then we get and then we get to for me and for a lot of people the saddest scene in the film. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Just, uh, yeah. Um. I, I actually did a much better job at keeping the waterworks off um, for this. Did um, you? Yeah, I did. Act, I, I did actually do a better job of keeping the waterworks off for uh, for this compared to watching the rescuers yesterday. But um, I was the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, I say we all we'll see. But but before that, it's uh, you got Amos heading to Widow Tweed's house. You can't you can't keep that fox lock, locked in there forever. And that's the realization that Widow Tweeds is like, yeah, I need, I need, I need to let him go. Mm. And then, and then we get to the song "Goodbye May Seem Forever," and yeah, just, <sighs> just good luck getting through this without shedding a tear, folks. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, don't get me wrong, I was still, I, I was still uh, sad watching it. Yes, but, um, but yeah. Um, no, this, but, this scene got me. This scene got me. Yeah, <laughs> I say, I say, it, it it does get it does get it does. I say those sort of scenes do get to a lot of the uh, the older Disney fans um, that grew up watching these films as kids. It these sort of scenes do get to the uh, the older um, uh, uh, the older Disney fans so from like our generation onwards. These sort of mm-hmm. scenes do get to us a bit more than they yes. did as um, uh, as children as, as when we were kids. Yeah. Um, as, and then, and the, the last, the last thing that Todd sees of Widow Tweed is just her looking back at him, and you just and you just see the tear rolling down her face, and you're just like, yeah, that has got to suck on so many levels. Goodbye. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. And <sighs> what's the what's the bubs catch in the worm when you need it? <laughs> yeah, but but was it the uh, but when oh boy. Uh, and th- and then and then of course with this sort of scene you get a storm you get the rain, Aye. and yeah, and from okay, uh, this is probably the only instance of uh, recycled animation that I could find in this film. In this film, yeah, yeah the squirrel. Uh, not not just the squirrel, but um, but you've got like uh, you've got like the birds, you've got like uh, the birds running. Uh, with their with their chicks underneath their their wings, and you've got uh, the mm-hmm. you've got the ducks going into the um uh, the water. A lot of the as a those sort of shots they uh, they come f- uh, well. Uh, two of those shots in particular they they come from uh, Bambi during the um, uh, yeah, Little they're... April showers scene. Mm-hmm. That's, um... that's like I say, I say, this is this is the only instance of uh, recycled animation throughout um, throughout this film. This is a case where I don't mind the recycled animation as much because, again, it, it, it's only main, it's only used yeah. in like little side parts. It's not yeah. used. It's, it's not. It's, it, it, COD. it's yeah. It's it's not as it, it's it's not something like Robin Hood with the Phony King of England sequence. Yes, yes, <laughs> but it's just Aristocats. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, Aristocats, Snow White, Jungle Book. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, but anyway. Um, then we, um, Todd trying to find uh, so Todd, Todd trying to find somewhere for shelter, and uh, he ends up going into this um, the set this set, which is uh, being occupied by a badger voiced, and this is and this is the character that's voiced by uh, John McIntyre, who is um, uh, Jeanette Nolan's uh, husband. Husband. Yeah, uh, the badger is not a very nice person to say the least. No. <laughs> Yeah, definitely sets the yeah the ambience. Yeah, and then you've got the uh, and then you've got the um, and then you've got the porcupine, who's voiced by John Fiedler, uh, who's who's done a couple of other Disney films uh, previously, including being most prominently Piglet in the Winnie the Pooh franchise. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I recognised him this time around. Yeah, it's like it's because like, because like, 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 because 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 you hear you hear his voice as the porcupine. And then you and then you have that side by side with him, uh, as as Piglet in Winnie the Pooh. Yes, because uh, yeah. because uh, Piglet's introduction to the Winnie the Pooh franchise was Winnie the Pooh in the Blustery Day. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, where so where so where Todd's actually left? He's actually left inside a, a game reserve, and he and then and you got Big Mama looking uh, for Todd later down the road. And he, um, uh, she ends up finding uh, Vixie, who's the, um, uh, mm-hmm. who, who's a vixen, and she is voiced by Sandy Duncan. Now, again, again, this is a name I'm not overly uh, familiar with, but as far as her uh, filmography is concerned, uh, she does have an uncredited role. In uh, Midnight Cowboy in 1969, she's uh, she's she's done a couple of she's she's done me. It's been mainly TV movies that she's done. It was a uh, uh, TV movie of Pinocchio in 1976, Christmas in Disneyland the same year, uh, Parade of Stars in 1983, a My Little Pony movie in 1984. Mm-hmm. Um, she was Rockadoodle, which was a Don Bluth uh, film in uh, 1991. Uh, she was also Queen um, Queen Uberta um, Queen Alberta uh, U B E R T A in uh, the mm-hmm. Swan Princess in 1994. I know. Yeah, uh, she's uh, she's got she's got a few. Um, she's got a f- but... Yeah, she's got a few TV roles uh, as well. Uh, also a few, also a few. Uh, st- and I've just I've just seen a lot of the prolific roles that she's done uh, for her theatre credits, so I'll quickly I'll get through those uh, shortly. But um, she even appeared on the Muppet Show in 1976. Who wasn't on the Muppet Show? <laughs> uh, yeah, ex- exactly. I mean, even Mark Hamill and the Star Wars cast were yeah. on at <laughs> one point. <laughs> 
at least it was much better than the Star Wars Christmas special. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah, but as far as Sandy's uh, theatre credits are concerned, I'm just going to rattle off the most prolific ones. South Pacific, My Fair Lady, Sound of Music, uh, twice, in fact, once in 64 and then again in 67, Peter Pan in 66, um, Canterbury Tales in 69, Chicago in 96 and 97, uh, The King and I twice, once in 58 and again in 2004. Uh, so, yeah, she's, she's got, yeah, again, somebody that's um, not necessarily the most prolific um, as far as Disney credits are concerned, yeah. but, uh, but uh, the resume elsewhere speaks for yes. itself. Mm-hmm. And, and I mean, you do, you do tend to find I think, that, that, that's one of the things I love about going through like uh, the um, the, uh, uh, the cast go, go, going through if they've been in Disney films previously or if they've done any like pr- uh, major films or TV shows or in, or in this case theater and theater credits as well. I mean, I'll say one of the most prolific. I'll say, uh, I'll say one of the most prolific um, actors that, that I spent a fair chunk of time on when recording the episode is one Vincent Price, who was Rattigan in The Great Mouse yes. Detective. I think the amount of time that me and my guest spent just talking about Vincent Price. <laughs> yeah. Um, like, and and, and, so and it's, when you, it's when you get segments like that that actually, uh, in a way, help bolster uh, the episode's... Um, uh, both of the episodes runtime and, and it's why I've got like uh, a couple of episodes that uh, that go over the uh, the two hour uh, the two hour mark yeah. I would imagine the Renaissance films they're gonna be two they're gonna be the two, they're gonna be two hours easily yeah I'll probably just spend about 45 minutes talking about the cast <laughs> yeah uh, not not just the cast but also um but also in my case talking about the soundtracks for yes. each of the films. And then of course, and then of course in the legacy section, uh, be it video games, uh, awards that they've won, mm-hmm. if, if, it's, if it has any, if it's had any sequels. So yeah. Um, I was like, um, then we see Todd uh, trying to um, big himself up, uh, come across as really confident towards, um, towards Vixie. And uh, yeah, it does not go to plan. T- claims <laughs> claims to be a, a fishing expert, and Big Mama's just watching. Oh, pl- please let him catch this! Please let him catch this! <laughs> yeah, and uh, and of course, if you if you if you're bigging yourself up and showing and showing off, just expect things to just fall south very quickly. Yeah, yeah, and then and then they end up having then they end up having a, a bit of a fallout, and then. And then we get to the last song of the film. I just need to get the uh, soundtrack up there. It is uh, appreciate uh, appreciate the lady. That's the um, that's the so, one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's the um, was it, that that's the song that, uh, that actually helps the um, that actually helps uh, Todd and Vixie uh, make amends rather swiftly, I should say. Yes, yes. No, that's my only sort of problem with the film yeah. is that the relation the romance isn't really well developed but then again this film isn't really about the romance yeah but it's I say, it, it, it's disney they they have had a tendency of not having yeah. very well developed romances yeah <laughs> but yeah. um but that but that being said it still does does still doesn't take away from the fact that we end that scene with this fantastic shot yes. uh where um they see uh, they see a they see a forest bird and they've got like uh, seven uh, chicks and then and then Vixie's just like I think six would be just perfect and then Todd's just Todd being as clueless being clueless at this point wait six what doesn't take <laughs> Sherlock Holmes to fill in the blanks on that one <laughs> ba- or Basil of Baker Street in Disney there you go <laughs> you bet me to it <laughs> I'm on the ball tonight. <laughs> At, at, at least, at least the weather didn't get to me as much today. Yes. <laughs> apart from apart from the fact that when I went to get something from uh, the co-op, I ended up getting my bus pass out to pay for it instead of my card. <laughs> hey, it happens to the, the happens sun does to the, weird things to you. <laughs> it happens to the best of us, folks. It happens <laughs> to the best of us. Uh, 
and then we get and then we get to uh, uh, and then we get to the third act of the film, the climax. Mm -hmm. uh, no hunting, game preserve, because you've got uh, Amos. Um, he's demonstrating how the, uh, the bear trap works to uh, copper. copper. And I say like, no music at that point, and he's using the, uh, using uh, a stick, a stick, as effectively uh, Todd, and then just just seeing how quickly that bear trap just boom, and then just the light, uh, the thunder and lightning, to just end that end that particular scene, and just like, yeah, this is gonna be a this is gonna be a pretty dark climax. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's just. Everything from everything from the lighting, the music, and then just and then just how it all plays out on screen, uh, mm -hmm. as well as far as the as far as the um, uh, the animation is concerned, because you, you, you get yeah. like you get a, a brief fight between Todd, Todd and uh, Todd and Copper, and I say and yeah, that's that's the point where you are just like, are these two going to be able to be friends again? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the snarls between oh. the, the two characters there, they're very very realistic it's, yeah. it's quite scary <laughs> especially when uh, when copper goes to bite todd and essentially goes straight towards the audience it's like ah yeah that, genuinely yeah, that, startling yeah, yeah, that, yeah that that would definitely uh unset that would definitely unsettle the kids in the audience yeah mm -hmm. I, was like, I, was like, I, I can only imagine what the kids must have uh, been like back in 1981 when uh, when this film originally came out. Yes. Yeah, but um, let's see, and, and and then we and then um, you got um, uh, Todd and Vixie. They're trapped. Uh, one end, you've got Copper just like clawing, trying to get in, and then yeah. the other end, you got you've got these uh, you've got these um, you got the dry grass and. And Amos lighting it, lighting up. effectively blocking that exit off. And then you just like, <laughs> yeah, uh, their only chance. And then somehow they managed to they managed to get out without any. Uh, uh, oh, they, managed to, they managed to get out without ma any uh, major, um, without any um, <laughs> injuries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, and I actually and I actually put in in my notes here where the um, the, um the, this is their only way out the, the this is their only way out and uh, and and then when they managed to escape um, I say I put in my notes yeah Amos you were saying <laughs> yeah yeah should have just so, stood by that hole with his shotgun but... yeah he he, he could have done but um but uh, for, for, because you say. He, he didn't really didn't he didn't really didn't really think of that yeah <laughs> but, but um but yeah <laughs> and then this is the case uh, um he, he, even he's just like i i cannot believe this has just happened and and i'm sitting here like yeah you and me you and me both amos yeah, <laughs> yeah. and uh and then and then we reach the waterfall which is where this which is where they're like deep the final part of this climax mm -hmm. takes place. Um, yeah. Um, the, Vic, Vixie and Todd, they uh, they start making their way uh, up the waterfall, and they and you've got Copper at the at the bottom, um, mm -hmm. and he, uh, he, he, he he still manages to pick up uh, Todd's scent, and then um, and then Amos and then Amos with his shotgun, and then and they. And then you just see him start looking up, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and then you and then you see and then you see the shadow start to um, go over him, and you're just like, wait, what? <laughs> you got a black freaking bear? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Not not Winnie the Pooh type of bear. Not, uh, no, 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 not no, no. This <laughs> this is oh, oh boy, but yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's an interesting thing regarding the, the bear snarl, uh, uh, um, uh, the snarling of the bear, especially, mm -hmm. uh, it's the same, it's the same snarl that's used for Shere Khan in the Jungle Book and Brutus and Nero in the previous film, The Rescuers. Rescuers, yeah. 
I thought I'd recognised it. I couldn't really pinpoint it. Yeah. Um, I say, I say, I say, I say, these are the sort of things that these are the sort of things where when you are doing research for doing an, uh, a series like this that you do mm -hmm. pick up on these things. Yeah, or for just simply watching the movies constantly, you will you will eventually get yeah. sick and tired of some of these sound effects and some of these voice actors. Yeah, especially Indeed. in the early days. Yeah, and uh, and and this is one of those rare instances where you actually see uh, blood on screen. Yes, during during this part of the film, because you see, um, Amos takes a shot, and boom, right into the bear's shoulder, and you just see the fur rip Bit apart, of... and you see the red, and you're just like, yowzers! Mm -hmm. I say that that's just only going to aggravate the bear all the more, and yeah. and then so is it Amos just like stepping backwards, and then snap, it, his foot gets caught in a bear trap. Yeah, and you just. Oh boy, I, I I mean I would say what goes around comes around, but uh, that wouldn't be appropriate because I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, when you've got when you've got a big freaking bear that's gonna effectively kill you, yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you're not gonna be watching where you're going. You're gonna be paying attention to the yeah. bear, so it's inevitable this sort of thing is gonna happen. But, um. The, the bit that makes this the make the bit that makes it uh, even uh, even tougher uh, uh, to watch as far as the intensity is concerned is that is that uh, he's um, is that he's trying to reach his he's trying to reach his shotgun but it uh, but but of course a, cl a, a classic trope in these sort of uh, in these sort of uh, climaxes he reaches he tries to go for it but it's just out of reach because of something getting in the way in this case yeah. the bear trap on his foot yes. But um, but it, it, but it, that 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 doesn't really detract that doesn't really detract from the um, that doesn't really detract from the um, um, from, from this uh, uh, this climax. Mm -hmm. uh, and you and you've got you've got copper um, uh, you've got copper. He, uh, he 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 manages to get uh, he manages to claw at the at the bear at one point. Uh, and yeah. and you actually you actually you actually see the red from the the claw marks that uh, copper leaves. And then, and then the bear just boom, and uh, and Copper is almost out for the count, and then and then Todd he is super Todd, yeah, comes and saves the day, yeah, just just storms in and uh, storms in goes for the bear, and 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 Vixie's just like wait wait Todd where are you going, and uh, and just effectively without saying anything. I'm gonna save my friend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and and, and th those are the sort of moments that are actually really powerful, because mm -hmm. because I mean I mean again uh, I've I've said it before uh, when uh, going through the uh, uh, going through Mulan. Uh, well, I haven't I haven't covered Mulan on this series yet, but mm -hmm. uh, I I, I will get round to covering it during the Renaissance period uh, over the summer. Um. um when when you have when you have a when you have like a, a scene or like a moment that um, that just doesn't need any dialogue, it's, yeah. it, it's just a testament to how powerful just powerful uh, a testament to how powerful that scene or moment is. As in this yeah. case, uh, in this case with the fox and the hound, um, it's like Vixie effectively asking Todd where he's going, and Todd without saying anything, I'm gonna I'm gonna save my friend. It, and in Mulan's case, as far as a powerful scene is concerned, taking her dad's place in the army, all yeah. that was needed for that scene was the visuals and the music. visuals and the music to help drive the story. Yeah. No dialogue at all. And it's one of the reasons why that's one of my favorite scenes in all of Disney. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's one of the reasons why I love this climax. I love yeah. just having the animators fully express themselves. Yeah. Um, yeah, and and not and not you know, and not really and not relying heavily on dialogue and just and just letting and just letting the visuals drive the story mm -hmm. and and the music in the background it the, the music throughout this scene as well it is really intense but again it adds to the it it adds to the intensity of this climax which works in the film's favor. Yes, and then and then we and then we reach the and then we reach the. Um, and then we reach um, 
the pivotal point here where you've got mm-hmm. um what's it where it's um where you've got like you've got like you've got like, you've got like bass instruments um yes. throughout um throughout this particular part here um todd on this log that's on the that's on the um uh, the, that's on the waterfall the bear goes for one last swipe and it break, breaks the log and then all you and then you just hear and then you just hear this on the synthesizer on what i can only assume is a synthesizer Synth. mm-hmm. say, they, they, they used, using a synthesizer for for that sort of like um uh that descent and then you and then you just see the um and then you just see the um the wa- you, you just see the water at the bottom of the waterfall just like just effectively being swirled up at the bottom of the waterfall mm-hmm. and uh yeah the the bears the bears dead but yeah. Todd did sustain some um uh, did sustain some injuries throughout that um and uh, with that fall yeah. and and copper does copper does find him and then you just and then off screen you hear a gun click and you, and then you just and then you just like whoa <laughs> amos pointing the gun effectively at the camera yeah <laughs> and and and, you, and it's just, it's just the yeah. music stink at that point as well mm-hmm. T- telling copper get out of the way he's down i'm going to mm-hmm. finish him but copper yeah. standing his ground oh yes Showing a bit of aye, yeah, um, and then showing the the friendship that they once had, yeah, still there, yeah, and 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 Amos eventually concedes, he mm-hmm. concedes That's defeat, let's let's Todd live, and this is this is a really this is a really bittersweet ending, yes, yes, oh yes, uh, okay. I say, I say, I say, if anything, this is this is a, this is another really sad scene, uh, if you will. I say, it's probably like a close second compared to um, letting Todd go. Yeah, I say, of the I say, a very close second because it's it's the end of the film. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and um, we um, we cut back to we cut back to the uh, the homestead, uh, effectively. Uh, the homestead farm, whatever you want to call it. Um, uh, as a big mama, he, um, a big mama hearing uh, uh, Boomer and uh, Dinky still trying to get uh, Squeaks the caterpillar, and uh, and then uh, it turns out that um, as it with with the sort with the sort of like a light, the sort of like um, sort of like a disco sort of kaleidoscope. Yes, kaleidoscope. Mm-hmm. That, yeah, that works better. Yeah. Uh, the kaleidoscope inside that, um, inside the hollow of the tree, uh, mm-hmm. Squeaks has become a butterfly. Yep. Yeah, and and they're just like, yeah, there's something very familiar about this guy. <laughs> <laughs> and then I said, and then I said, I said, and big big mama knows that it's uh, it's, it's Squeaks. Squeaks. I said, and then and uh, I was like. I say, a sweet moment there. Wish, wishing Squeaks all the best, mm-hmm. um, and we and we see uh, we see Widow Tweed actually looking after Amos with the bandage on on his foot, like, and uh, say, similar Amos, to Chief. Yeah, Amos being a real crybaby over this, yeah. and, then, <laughs> and then Chief is just Chief in his battle, just like all this, all this over a broken leg. <laughs> yeah, and then and then and then. Just to drive home at how sad the uh, the ending of this film is, you get a call back to that line that we'll always be friends forever. We get a, mm-hmm. we actually hear that, um, we actually hear we, we actually get a call back to that line mm-hmm. at, at the end of the film. And I say it is just I say I actually, I actually put that down as a bittersweet callback, yes. Yeah, no, I'm I'm a huge fan of bittersweet endings. I tend I have a tendency to sort of look more in the the positive side. Yeah. Um, and yeah, uh, this uh, best way that the film could possibly end, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, especially the final shot. You you see the the farm area, 
and then it pans out and then on the hill top you see Todd and his missus looking yeah. at them. Looking sort of similar to the Bambi ending, I guess. Um, yeah. Bambi and his father. Yeah. Um, so, so I said, that, that's, that's interesting that you brought that up. Yeah, it, it, be, it being a, a, a similar ending. A, a, mm-hmm. a similar ending shot. Yes. Mm-hmm. But yeah, there we go. That is it. Um, that is it. We have, that's us covered the, uh, that, that is us. We have covered the, uh, Fox and the Hound. Fox and the Hound. I say, I say, this is, um, I say, like I said, this is definitely, uh, this is definitely one of the, this is definitely uh, one, one of their more mature uh, films that mm-hmm. they, uh, that they've done, but, but uh, m- mature in the sense that it's, uh, it does, uh, it does get, it does get, ki- it does get, it does get the kids to re- really think, th- re- mm-hmm. really think about these, uh, these more, uh, more adult uh, issues. Yeah. Was it, was it without without being without being too patronising at the same time? Yeah, it's it's not preachy. Um, yeah. It's not it's not dark in a typical Disney sense where it feels the need to be scary all the time. I mean, yes, there are obviously very tense moments. Yeah, but, but it, it's yeah. darker more on a, a thematic level. Yeah, I think. Yeah. So now on to now on to the scores. Now, uh, just a quick heads up, folks. I I did. I was like. I haven't actually I haven't actually been able to do this for a while, but uh, well, was it, um, I, I, I haven't really done this as far as like high scores across the board are concerned uh, since uh, Winnie the Pooh, which was just uh, just a couple of episodes ago. But mm-hmm. um, but nevertheless, um, I say the story, uh, dis- despite despite the uh, despite the issues with the, the romance, uh, which which was uh, it, which was for- forgiven. Um, yeah, because because that was what Disney were like known for the romance. Not, but but like you said, it wasn't really focusing on the romance per se. It was more on like the main the thing being between. the friendship between Todd and Copper. So overall, from how well they managed to uh, adapt the um, from how well they managed to adapt the story material and uh, um, make make uh, alterations to the to the darker moments of um, story. of of the source material and. I, I, I gave I gave the story a ten. I couldn't I couldn't really fault I couldn't really fault the story on uh, on my end throughout the um, throughout watching it. Yep. No, I can I can definitely. Yep. I side with you. I'm seeing a ten as well. And it's and uh, and and uh, Michael Michael said to the, Michael said this to me previously. It is very rare that he does give out tens. Yes. But, um, I have given it a, a few times in the Kingdom of Isolation, but I think yeah. on all occasions it has been towards the animation. Story-wise, yeah. I've never really given out any 10s, mm-hmm. uh, but this one, I think it's a 10 because, again, there's a slight issue of the romance not being yeah. well developed, but it's not about that. It's about mm-hmm. the friendship. And I think an issue, uh, th- something that I could see being a potential issue mm-hmm. when I first watched it very recently, yeah. Um, was the sort of slapstick Wiley e. Coyote stuff mm. with the worm and stuff or yeah. the caterpillar. Um but I think the those scenes definitely come in at the right time. Um yeah. they don't feel anywhere near as mm-hmm. a drastic change of tone. Um yeah. especially for Disney. Disney have this mm-hmm. this thing where they this the tone just sort of changes like that. Yeah. Whereas with this it, it, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, ten. Yeah, ten for the story. Was the um, I say, I say the ca- characters. Um, I say characters to me. Uh, I, I I gave them a nine. Uh, was it that the um? Was it, I mean, I mean, I, was like, I I just I just feel that um, I feel with uh, uh, the porcupine and the badger, I f- I feel I feel that they could have uh, they could have. Uh, I mean, d- dare I say? I mean, and not nothing against nothing against the actors that portrayed those uh, those characters, but uh, I feel I feel in a way I say given given how given how, uh, given how they're on like only on screen for like a few seconds, if that, mm-hmm. uh, it, it it feels like that those two characters were for me a bit unnecessary. Yes, to an extent. Um, the Badger definitely does a good job at setting what this it sets up the, the change in scenery 
and yeah. the change in setting for mm-hmm. Todd. Um, yeah. How it is a bit more rough. Yeah. And a bit more but, uncaring. But, um, but, but uh, but but for me, I, I, but for me, I, I just feel the um, I just feel that uh, I just feel like uh, a goodbye may seem forever. The uh, uh, the visuals of the uh, of the storm. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I just I just felt that I just felt that was I felt that was more than enough to be able to uh, establish that this is this is a completely different um, this is com- this is going to be completely different to what um, uh, Todd has been. Um, uh, used to uh, growing up, so yeah, that's like, yeah, that's, that's like, I say, I, I just feel the porcupine and uh, the badger were not really that, not really that necessary for, from my perspective, anyway, folks. Mm-hmm. I also gave the characters a 10, sorry, a nine, sorry, not a 10, sorry, that just <laughs> a nine. It's, it's fine. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I gave the characters a nine. <laughs> um, just the fact that the like you say, the, the other side characters, even the romantic interest, she doesn't need to be there necessarily. Um, but they do, they are there to just sort of beef the world up a bit. Yeah. Um, but in regards to the five main characters, being yeah. the, the two humans, yeah. Chief, Copper and Todd, yeah. Todd. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I can't fault them. Um, mm-hmm. I just wish that those other smaller roles were maybe a bit stronger yeah um, like, like yeah yeah big mama dinky and uh yeah and boomer as well yeah mm-hmm. no they're, they're good as well um mm-hmm. but i just the, the the forest creatures will say the mm-hmm. the forest creatures i think they could have been yeah. a bit stronger this film could have done with a a tomorrow and pumba um yeah or something like that but... mm-hmm. yeah yeah nine yeah actually gonna tweak gonna tweak my score slightly uh, visuals 9.5 I did have it as a 9 initially the only the only thing that stops it the only stop the only thing that stops me from giving it a 10 say it with me folks is the recycled animation, the animation. That's, it. Th- that's the only thing that stops it from getting a 10 mm-hmm. I agree I agree 9.5 that's yeah um Again, I didn't have that big of an issue with the recycled animation in this case because it was yeah. just for the the very very smaller roles. Yeah, like one one or two shots, but yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, nine point five. Mm-hmm. I agree. Yeah, I agree. I, I especially again, I love especially towards the end of the climax how mm-hmm. brutal it gets, um, yeah. especially in regards to the the snarls of the animals. Um, yeah, they are very, very frightening. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, the yeah. the earlier portions of the movie where Todd and Copper are just playing about, it's just very nice. Makes you feel very wholesome. Gives you a, a slight yeah. sense of nostalgia. Um, yeah, but yeah, just the recycled animation as you said. Yeah. I'll say, I'll say, yeah, I'll say, that's the only thing that stops me from. That's the only thing that stops me from giving it a ten. But uh, mm-hmm. but apart from that. Cannot fault the visuals throughout. Yeah. Uh, uh, sa- soundtrack, the soundtrack that's a ten. Cannot fault it throughout. I mean, I mean, yes. I mean, I mean, yes. The um, I mean, I mean, yes. Uh, a couple of the songs uh, are not really as as memorable, but uh, but but the songs as a whole they do they do help drive the story along really well. Yes, and and. I say, and 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 like, and like and like I said, like I said at the start of the uh, the episode, where, uh, like at the start of the film, this is what I'm. This is what I'm after as far as a score that uh, is concerned. I mean, I mean, yes, to my knowledge, I don't think the film score has actually been released on like um on like on like on a physical media or on somewhere mm-hmm. like Spotify or Apple Music, but um, I say, the film score, I say, a film score that stands out throughout. Uh, and not just for like one or two moments. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is see, that. That's the sort of film score that I. That's the sort of soundtrack that I'm after. A film score that stands out throughout, and um, and and the songs helping to drive the story along. Yeah. No. Um, 
I'm not going to give it a 10. I'm going to give it a 9. I just wish that those those songs were maybe a bit more memorable. I mean, the, the Best of Friends one yeah. is solid, but the other two have just sort of faded from my memory. Um, mm-hmm. But as you said, the, the score is very strong. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I am a fan of my film scores, and I think that this one definitely does a good job at capturing both the, the wholesome, mm-hmm. childlike, nostalgic side of the story, yeah. as well as the dark intense mm-hmm. threatening scenes of the story yeah. so that so there we are folks we we are men of very uh, sophisticated taste as far as film soundtracks are concerned yes yes i've, I've got I've, I've got a full playlist on uh, spotify uh, that i've created <laughs> of, just of, film, of just score. film score yeah i mean i mean i mean hard to argue with that because I've, I've i've said it i've said it in conversation i've said it just in conversation before that when it comes to film soundtracks it's always the score that i mentioned first rather than mm-hmm. the songs that were used in the film because to me i just feel the score has a has a more powerful impact yes it uh, definitely on, on drives the, the emotion yeah because i mean there's there's one i mean one particular film score that I, that i just absolutely adore it's from one of my favorite sports films coach carter uh trevor mm. rabin who uh who did the score for the film uh so there's there's a couple of particular moments in that film let's say where you've got um uh timo cruz he doesn't get his place on the team because he, he comes up short on what uh, what he needs to give them um, uh the coach and yeah. then and then the team decide Let, let's help let's help him finish this off i think and the, the score at that point it the score it really does help drive home the unity that the, the team has, and then, and then later on in the film with that scene, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. That is probably mm. for me the most powerful scene of that film, and the score at that point as well is just yeah. incredible. And then of course, the and then of course that uh, the ending where they where they lose um, where they lose they lose the game at the end, but. Despite that, they're still, they're still, they're still winners in uh, the coach's mm-hmm. eyes. And, and, and again, the score at that point does, it 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 does at the start. It does drive home that uh, that sense of disappointment that yes, they didn't quite make it. But yeah. um, but once Swells they, up. yeah, let's see. But then, but then but then you end up on this um, uh, this message of hope that yes, despite despite that, I would. Despite that, you still, you still win us to me, and yeah. uh, couldn't be proud of you for that. Yeah, no, I definitely recommend listening to a film score when you're going out on a, yeah. a workout or a, a run or something. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what I mainly listen to when I go out running because the last thing you want oh. is to be singing along to a song whilst you're also exhausting yourself with exercise. Um, so yeah, the incredible soundtrack. That gets me going. That gets, ah. that gets me running. That gets Mike, me running. <laughs> God bless Michael Giacchino for that one. Yes. <laughs> Even the Ratatouille soundtrack, speaking oh. of Michael Giacchino. Okay. Yeah, love, love Ratatouille. Love Ratatouille. Yeah. Fantastic film. Right. You know what? I'm going to have you on board for the Ratatouille episode when I come yes. to film. Yes. Yes. <laughs> seen as... Uh, seen as Jack took uh, my spot and rescuers down under. I'll, I'll need to... <laughs> I need to talk about another mouse or rat movie at some point. <laughs> so. Yeah, uh, and la- and last of all, the uh, the legacy of the mm-hmm. film. Now, as far as right, so let's see what we have here. As far as the um, right, so um, right, so uh, our good friends at Rotten Tomatoes. The critical reception, seventy uh, percent. So it's border borderline fresh. On that's um, more than the rescues. Yeah, surprisingly, yeah. We we'll say, we'll say that. We we'll say that, that. That's based on the uh, retrospective uh, reviews. Um, right. uh, the consensus stating it's a likable, charming, unassuming effort that manages to transcend its thin, predictable plot. Um, wait, what? I'm sorry, what? Thin, predictable plot. Sometimes Rotten Tomatoes gets it wrong. <laughs> now, if you're familiar with the source material, I get it. But yeah, come on. I can 
I, I could not pinpoint what, where this film was going to go, especially for a Disney film. I was yeah. like, right, this is going to happen. This, see, when they introduced the bear trap, I was expecting that to just end up in some sort of comedic slapstick uh, or something like that. Yeah, but, but, no, it, no, but no, it was it was used in a dramatic, intense way. Yes, very, yes. Um, that predictable my behind. Yeah, exactly. Tomatoes. Exactly. Yeah. Fix yourself. I mean, I'll never, I'll, I'll never trust Rotten Tomatoes after what they've given the the road to El Dorado. I believe, I believe that was oh, in like the fifties or something. Fifty oh. percent for Road to oh. El Dorado. Are you kidding? Oh boy, I, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm dreading, I'm dreading this. I'm, I'm, I'm actually right now. I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I'm actually dreading this right <laughs> now. Uh, yeah, uh, but yeah, um, but yeah, um. I see, I see, just on a bit more of a positive note, uh, uh, when my get when when my guest covered uh, many adventures of Winnie the Pooh with me, it's one of those rare films that has a one hundred percent rating on Rotten Tomatoes. What? Yeah, the Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh has a one hundred percent rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Yes, yes, that's well deserved. That's that's yeah. well deserved. Yeah, let's let's see what's it. Oh my word! It's a, oh that is that is worse than I was fearing. That was is it worse mid-50s? than I was doing. <laughs> um, the audience score sixty six percent. The the critics based on one hundred and six reviews for Road to El Dorado forty eight percent. Forty eight. Forty eight percent. Jesus, less than half. They need to rewatch the film. I watched that film again last week. Yeah, wowzers. A lot better than I remembered. <laughs> yeah, it was like. I see, I see, I see, those those sort of DreamWorks films that uh, I don't actually, I don't actually, um, I didn't actually watch when I was, um, I was younger because I mean, I mean, I mean, yes, I watched, yes, I watched Shrek, but um, mm-hmm. the uh, 2D stuff. Yeah, I didn't really. Um, I see. Uh, I said when I was younger, I, uh, there was there was like, a couple of cinema trips planned for like a um, for like uh, a, a summer a summer club I was um, uh, part of. Uh, a couple of cinema trips to see Spirit Stallion of the Cimarron, and I was just like, n- I was just like, no, I, d- I don't want to go and see this because I, mean, I wasn't, I was like, I wasn't really into those, I wasn't really into those uh, sort of films at the time. But mm-hmm. after watching it for the first time about four or five years ago, I was, I was missing out on my favorite film composer Hans Zimmer for crying out loud. I was missing out on my favorite film composer when I was a kid with that film. I've never seen Spirit. Um, but now that you've mentioned that Hans Zimmer done the music, uh, yeah, definitely and, uh, add to the watch list. I say, I say uh, uh, there is there is a spirit film coming out uh, later this summer, Spirit later. Untamed, mm-hmm. and uh, I say, cause, 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 as, as soon I say I, I've seen the trailer a couple of times, and as soon as, soon as they as soon as they mentioned uh, Spirit, and, and it was it was uh, Spirit DreamWorks, I was just like, oh my word, we're getting another spirit film. And I was, and I was, I was actually in tears watching the trailer, and I was just like, "Yes, I need to go and see this." Let's <laughs> uh, say, 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 "Spirit Rose El Dorado." Those, those films from that sort of era from DreamWorks that are that often get criminally uh, overlooked. Yes. I mean, Rose El Dorado just for how fun it is, and Spirit mm-hmm. just from how beautiful it is. Yes, from visual presentation, and of course, the score by Hans Zimmer. Especially yeah. the ending, and I, mm-hmm. I I won't go into too much detail regarding the ending, but the score at the ending of that film is just it's it's a gut punch of emotion to say the least. I'll add it to my my running playlist. Um, okay. Yeah, no, DreamWorks definitely had a, a nice little trilogy of two D animated films, and then they made Sinbad, <laughs> mm, <laughs> which. Yeah. I'll, I'll, say, I'll, say, I'll, say, I'll say the, uh, the trilogy I am assuming includes Prince of Egypt, correct? Yes, yes. That, that Jack was the big one. another Hans Zimmer score. Yes. Fantastic. Yeah. I mean, I'll say, I'll say Prince of Egypt, it is definitely up there as one of the best DreamWorks films that they've, um, that they've done. With, one of the best animated films. Yeah, th- there you go, folks. But yeah, but anyway, but, but, but uh, Accolade, accolades and box office for um, 
Fox, oh, and, I, Hound. Fox and the Hound. Yeah, I forgot we were talking about that film. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the first time we we've gone on completely different tangents, <laughs> but uh, it it won't be the last. It won't be the last. But but yeah, um, on its original release, it, it was just under. 40 million dollars in domestic uh, at the domestic box office uh which at the time was the highest for it was the highest grossing animated film for its initial release domestically and um, and then and it's um uh, the international the international rentals which is the uh, international the world like uh, the international box office elsewhere mm-hmm. um 43 uh, million dollars internationally it got a re-release in 1988 and it grossed another 23.5 uh, million there making it uh, a grand total of 63.5 million dollars uh, domestically now i'm not sure what that i'm not sure what that translates to as far as worldwide box office is concerned um okay oh. Nope, that's not what I'm after. Box office mojo, where you at? <laughs> You've got Kurt Russell and Mickey Rooney to, to thank for the yeah the increase in ticket sales. Yeah. The uh... ah, it doesn't it doesn't actually it doesn't actually give us any information regarding the. Um... Uh, the international total uh, on box office mojo. It just has the uh, domestic totals. Oh well. Right. Uh, but yes, yeah. we don't matter. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but still, but still, effectively forty million dollars on mm-hmm. a twelve million dollar budget, effectively tripling what the tripling um, what the film cost to make. Yeah, not bad. Uh, it even had it even had uh, a comic book adaptation. Uh, as well. Yeah. So is Fox and the Hound going to be in the MCU sometime soon? <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Wouldn't put wouldn't put it wouldn't put it past the realm of possibility. <laughs> um, I was like, um, I was like, so I'm just I'm just going to read what it says in here, uh, as well as adaptations. So, comic strips featuring the characters also appeared in stories unconnected to the film. Examples include the Lost Fawn, in which Copper uses his sense of smell to help Todd. Todd find a fawn who has gone astray. A chase in which Copper must safeguard a sleepwalking chief. Okay. Okay, now we're <laughs> somewhere. Feathered friends, which uh, Dinky and Boomer must go to desperate lengths to save one of Riddle Tweed's chickens from a wolf. <laughs> okay. That sounds fantastic. A comic adaptation of the film drawn by Richard Moore Published in newspapers uh, as part of uh, Disney's Treasury of Classic Tales. Um, and a f- there was a few Fox and the Hound Disney comics uh, produced in Italy, Netherlands, Brazil, France, and of course the USA. Well, I'm just going to see if I can see any of these comic strips online. Yeah, I was like, I, was like, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, it'd be a, it'd be a great, cl- I mean, they'd be a great collector's item. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. And then we get to uh, a particular era of their films that uh, might not go down well as far as the scores are concerned. The director video sequels, and this film was unfortunately victim to one of those. Fox and the Hound Two. Didn't need one. Yeah, Fox and the Hound the Two time. that that took place during the youth of Todd and Copper, um, involving Copper being tempted to join a band of stray dogs called the Singing Strays threatening the friendship with Todd. The friendship was already being threatened throughout the first film. We didn't need to see it again here. That's just, that's just the plot to Lady in the Tramp too. You just described to me there. <laughs> Pretty much scamp <laughs> joining a gang of dogs straying oh, himself from his family. These Disney sequels are Control C, Control V, effectively. Yes, <laughs> I will say if you're wanting a good Disney sequel, not that there's many out there uh, in regards to dogs. Uh, I do think that 101 Dalmatians 2, Patches, Patches London, London Adventure, Adventure, is very good. I okay. watched that. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I was like, 
as, as far as, as far as Disney sequels that I, that I would recommend, I mean, I mean the very first director video sequel that was made, Return, Return of Jafar, which was the second part of the Aladdin trilogy, and then that climaxed with Aladdin and the King of Thieves, which a lot mm -hmm. of people say is definitely up there as one of the best director video sequels, mainly yeah. because you've got mainly because you've got Robin Williams back as the genie. Oh yes, I mean, I mean, I, I mean, I actually had the entire Aladdin trilogy on VHS, VHS. at home, and and um, and of the three, of the three, uh, Return of Jafar I watched the least. Mm -hmm. Then it was uh, King of Thieves second, and then of course the original Aladdin. at the top. Because I mean, come on, the original is a classic. Oh yes. Thanks. They've been they've been on with me previously for a couple of episodes by themselves. But mm -hmm. uh, this will be the this will be the first time that I actually have them together. Oh, that's lovely. That's nice. Un unless I unless I can sweet talk Jack into getting you on board for the rescuers down under. Because oh yes, because because the rescuers down under did come out before Aladdin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and me and Jack are a couple. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Uh. But yeah. Mainly. Mainly. Uh. I mean. I mean. Th this. This sounds harsh for the score that I'm going to give it, but it's mainly because of how, mainly because of the uh, the critical crucifixion the sequel got. Mm -hmm. The legacy gets a seven from me, mainly because of the crucifixion the sequel got. A seven, Christ. Yeah. What would you have? What, what did you give the legacy then? If that's the case, I gave it an eight. Um... Mainly because I don't, I didn't know that there was much material after the first film. Um, in fact, I didn't even know there was a Fox and the Hound 2 up until very recently when I rewatched the film for this episode. And you know how in Disney Plus you get recommended another film as the oh, credits? Yeah, role? it did. It, 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 Fox it, and the Hound 2, and I'm like, eh? It did ended. recommend that to me as well. Um, <laughs> But yeah, oh. no, I, I gave it an eight because I, I think um, a lot of people, a lot of people that watched this as a child, this one sticks in their memory. Um, from what I've heard, I heard for years that this was one of the saddest Disney films. Um, yeah. And yeah, it definitely sticks with people. And I yeah. knew a lot of people that watched it. It doesn't have a lot of, I mean, Fox and Hound, I don't think they appear in Kingdom Hearts. I don't imagine they do. No, they didn't, no. Um, but uh, uh, They don't have at... a live-action remake in the, yeah. the works, thankfully, yeah. so... Uh, I, I, was, I, was, I was actually speaking to Jack regarding um, uh, regarding Kingdom Hearts, because uh, Jack, he's a massive yes. Kingdom Hearts fan. Uh, he actually helped me with some tips on getting past some of the more difficult uh, uh, sequences, in particular with Chain of Memories. The Sonic Blade in Chain of Memories, it is ridiculously overpowered. <laughs> yeah. And even I say, like, and I'm I'm not kidding. I was like, I was like, I was like, I was like, you get your you get your three cards in chain of memories, you, and you get Sonic Blade, and you just go absolutely <laughs> ham on the bosses. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I say like, um uh, I see Jack did say that uh, Square Enix are looking at going to are looking at going to worlds that they've uh, going to worlds that they've not been to previously. All right. Which gives us the opportunity to go to these lesser known Disney films. So Fox and the Hound could end up being there. there. You go. I mean, I mean, it could, but I'm not sure what they could do with it. But yeah. But, <laughs> I say, um, I say, I, I, I actually, I actually got this idea from uh, Gerard the Completionist, uh, another uh, YouTuber that I, I enjoy watching. Um, when he was, uh, when he was uh, talking about King, uh, the first Kingdom Hearts game, um, a world based on Mary Poppins, where you've got the yes. Heartless as chimney sweeps. All right. I mean, I mean, who wouldn't be on board with that? <laughs> Mainly because being able to go to Mer going being being able to go to the Mary Poppins world, seventeen mm -hmm. Cherry Tree Lane to be specific, but also like I say, the Heartless as chimney sweeps. I'm on board with that. Yes, <laughs> but, yeah. but yeah, 
But yeah, that being, that being said, though, uh, we, uh, I've, I've got the scores all calculated up, and we end up with a grand total of 91%. It's definitely a lot higher than uh, a lot... I say definitely a lot higher than a lot of you guys were expecting, but mm-hmm. but say, there's there's a lot to praise. There is a lot to praise with this film, and of course the it's it's only the legacy score that really let that really lets it, yeah, down. it down. Yeah, but still ninety one percent. It just squeaks into the top ten. It has just squeaked into the top ten. Yes. And um, uh, I wish I was kidding when I say this, folks. I have got three films in the top 10 that are tied on 92%. All right. So when it comes to so when it comes to rank so when it comes to ranking the, the films for for the for the next anniversary, uh, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna need to I'm gonna need to do something to like make that up. Yeah, to split the three. Yeah. Get but, nitpicky. Oh boy, yeah. But yeah, but still, into the top ten of the films that I've covered so far, that's that's no mean feat. No, and again, ninety-one percent. It's an A plus if you were to use the the the, uh, the grading system that we yeah. use in the UK. Yeah, uh, or, or even the American grading system, I would imagine. It'll be the same. Yeah, I would, I would assume so. Yeah, I'll say. What I might, what I might actually do, is once I've actually covered all these films, mm-hmm. uh, like the main ones from uh, Snow White to at the moment Ryu and the Last Dragon, yeah, do a tier list with all those films, and then, uh, and and of course, and of course, the um, the tiers they're going to go in are going to be based on the scores that they got, yeah, which is which which does make it easier. Mm-hmm. It does make it easier. Yeah. But, um, but yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's it, folks. Uh, I, I, was like, uh, I, I did record. I did record the. I did record all these episodes uh, out of order. But now that I'm effectively back on track, I've only got one f- episode left to do with Oliver and Company, and then on to the Renaissance for the summer. But until then, uh, I say, hope you guys enjoyed this episode. If you did, hit the thumbs up. And if you want to, if you want, if you want to be part of the Kingdom of Isolation as well, hit the subscribe button down at the bottom and click the bell to join the Dream Chasers notification squad so you don't miss anything that I do on this channel. The next episode that's going to go live is The Black Cauldron, arguably the darkest film that Disney has done. The closest they've done, the closest they've got to a horror film and the first animated Disney film to get a PG rating. <sighs> exciting stuff yeah but um but until then folks we will see you guys next time in the kingdom of isolation see you later